We're continuing in the series of moving from merely surviving to a place of thriving because we believe God called us to be fruitful and to thrive. Thriving is about being fruitful. Thriving is about being fruitful. God wants us to thrive in Him. As we consider this journey of taking, allowing God to take us to, to a place of thriving, it is important for us to recognize that you are right, you are made to thrive. Can, you ask, can I ask you to turn to your neighbor and say, you are blessed to thrive. Remember, we've been looking at Joseph's life and studying the things in his life that are very relevant for us. We studied how God called him to thrive and gave him a vision. And many of you have been given a vision to thrive. Joseph received that vision. He received that calling. But he had this pride, pride struggle. And we all battle with the struggle of pride. Pride can hold you back. Pride opens a door of destruction. And then we saw him struggle through this purity struggle. And uh, last week we covered how every single human being from Adam has had to face the purity struggle. But today I believe that we need to cover the purpose struggle. That's what we're here for this morning, the, the purpose struggle. Because many of us are sitting here this morning and maybe even saying, what is God's purpose for me? Maybe things haven't opened up for you the way you thought it should. Maybe you haven't had the education you wanted. Maybe you haven't had the opportunities you thought you would get. And you're struggling with the vision and the purpose God has called for you. And you, you, it's hard to reconcile just with, as Joseph, hard to reconcile God's plan. John writes, when Jesus was speaking, Jesus says, by this, your Father, Father God is glorified that you bear much fruit. In other words, God wants us to bear fruit. God wants us to thrive. He gives us the formula. He actually says, whoever abides in me, I will abide in him and they will bear much fruit. So not only does God want us to thrive, but he gives us the formula of how to thrive. And how to thrive is abiding in Christ and Christ in us. As we sit and think about, but what's my purpose? Maybe you're like Joseph and feel like your family is a bit of a mess and thrown into a pit, a family pit, and you're trying to work out the purpose. Or maybe you've been sold into debt and you're in debt in Potiphar's house. And maybe you're like Joseph and you've been falsely accused, defamed, and maybe even serving time in prison. And at that time, you, you, you're trying to work out What's my purpose? Well, I want to put it to you that the essential part of finding your purpose is starts with finding God's purpose. Can I ask you to say to your neighbor, find God's purpose? Because this is the purpose struggle, the struggle between what I want my purpose to be against what God's purpose is. And they don't always line up, do they? Because the flesh is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit is contrary to the flesh. And the Bible talks about this war that's going on. My flesh wants one thing. God's spirit wants another. Consider Joseph for a moment again. He receives the vision. He's thrown into the pit. He's sold into the Ishmaelites. He's sold as a slave to Potiphar's house. And then he's put in prison for, for standing against unrighteousness. He's thrown into prison. For doing the right thing, he's put into prison. Some would think, well, prison's not too bad. Do you know he was there up to 12 years? Jewish commentators write that he served between 11 and 12 years in prison. You talk about feeling abandoned, betrayed. Joseph knew those feelings. And yet something magnificent happened with Joseph because I believe he understood the purpose struggle. He understood the struggle of aligning to God's purpose. If we read Genesis 39 and just see some amazing things here in verse 21. 
But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison didn't look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with Joseph and whatever he did, the Lord made him prosper. God made Joseph prosper even in the prison. The interesting thing in purpose, please, this is really crucial. Imagine for a moment you, Joseph, you're falsely accused. Potiphar was the captain of the guard. Potiphar was working for Pharaoh. Potiphar believed his wife's lies and put Joseph into the prison belonging to the palace and the governmental system. In other words, Joseph was in prison, the prison that was holding him down for 12 years was the same entity organizational structure as Potiphar in Potiphar's house. But Joseph's position that he defaulted to was to immediately serve the jailer. The very entity and people that represent the false accusation and putting him into jail, instead of becoming bitter, he becomes better. Instead of serving himself and getting angry with God, he turns to serve the jailer. How many of us would uh, serve the jailer if we were thrown into prison for a false accusation. Listen to Jesus' words again. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. Many of us are waiting for the perfect person to serve. Most of us look at a person and say, they don't have my faith values. They don't have my faith. They're not walking in the same direction. So I I'm not going to serve him. In fact, I'm going to put a stick in the wheel. I'm going to stop this guy. Joseph doesn't look for his purpose. He looks for God's purpose. And God's purpose was to serve. Talk about a purpose struggle. This morning, let's recognize that when Joseph served, God empowered him. God gave him favor. God gave him grace. God gave him gifts. He immediately starts to serve using his administrative gifts. And he doesn't take the keys of the prison and open the door and let himself out as I would have. He keeps it and he runs the prison using his leadership gifts, his administrative gifts, his encouragement gifts, his discernment gifts, his godly understanding gifts, his wisdom gifts. He uses the gifts to serve the jailer. There's absolutely no record of Joseph saying, God, why did you do this to me? Why did you allow this to happen to me? Lord, if you are in control, just like the pastors say, the mundis say, God is in control. Well, if you're in control, then you either allowed this to happen or you caused this to happen. That I be betrayed by my family, that I be sold into slavery, that I be falsely accused and that I be put into prison. You either allowed this to happen or you caused this to happen. Can you imagine the pain that you and I would go through? But that's not what Joseph asks. So as we look at this, let's agree on a few things. There's three things I I feel like we really need to know as a church as we walk through this season. The first one is this, God is sovereign. Can I ask you to say to your neighbor, God is sovereign. 
You see, when I say God is sovereign, a lot of people think that means that God is in absolute control and therefore God causes everything to happen. Imagine, we know that the scripture says he's omnipotent, he's all powerful, he's omniscient, he's all knowing, he's omnipresent, he's everywhere. So therefore they say he's in absolute control. Let, let's just play this out a bit because one day, um, about 15 years ago, I was driving down the road, the Malaguan, and I was coming from a prayer meeting in the morning. It was about seven o'clock in the morning. I was driving just under 60 kilometers an hour down the old Malaguan. And it had been pouring with rain. There was oil across the highway. And uh, I kept going at about 60 kilometers down the Malaguan. And I hit a, a large stream of water, a large body of water, and uh, I lost control of the car. There's two lanes. I had the chance to go into the next lane because there's a big truck in front of me. So as I hit that water, I tried to pull right. The car didn't go right. I tried to pull left. The car didn't go left. I tried to slam on brakes. Nothing happened. I was aquaplaning. And as I was aquaplaning, there's nothing I could do but just be in the car and go right underneath the big truck. I went right underneath the big truck up until the windscreen. The whole front of the car completely lodged underneath the truck. If God is in complete control, then many would say, well, then why did God cause that to happen? Why did God tempt me to drive at 60 kilometers an hour on rain when there's, why, was, why did God tempt me to be distracted? Can I just show you a scripture just to clarify things? James chapter one, verse 13 says this. Remember, tell your neighbor, remember. When you are being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. Don't say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong and he never tempts anyone else. Can you tell your neighbor, God does not tempt you. Verse 14 says, but temptation comes from our own, own desires, the lust of our flesh. Some translations don't say desires, they say lusts. Temptation comes from our own lusts, from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. So let's be very clear. God didn't tempt me to drive too fast. Satan did. My flesh did. And if sovereign means God is in absolute control, then one would think that the source of my problems is God. I don't believe that's true. Because God doesn't tempt anyone. Actually, the scripture is very clear. Remember, God is love. God never lies. God never tempts. Can you say with me, God is love? If God is love and he's looking for my best interest all the time, how would that be from God? I, I want to show you seven things that maybe you, we don't really understand. The first thing is God is love, but let's recognize as much as God is love, God hates. Did you know that? God hates. God is love, but God hates too. In Proverbs 6, in verse 16 to 19, he shares seven things that God hates. Listen to this. God hates a false witness. Wasn't that exactly what Potiphar's wife was? A false witness? God hates pride. Wasn't she operating out of pride? God hates injustice. Wasn't that unjust? God hates greed. God hates the sowing of discord. Wasn't what she did, sowing discord. God hates the hands that shed innocent blood. We need to realize God is love, but God hates too. And most of what happened to Joseph, God absolutely hates. Consider this scripture for a moment, please. Psalms 5 verse 4. Oh God, you take no delight in wickedness. You take no pleasure in wickedness. In other words, God hates wickedness. So let's clarify that there's no way that God would have tempted me to speed and have a car accident. 
God cannot do evil. The typical or normal teaching on sovereignty kind of describes a situation where when we say God is sovereign, God is in control, there's this picture that Jesus is at the steering wheel of our lives. And we are simply passengers going wherever Jesus wants to take us. But do you know the scriptures paint a very different picture? The scripture paints the picture that you and I are given the steering wheel. You and I are given authority. You and I are told to take authority, take dominion. And Jesus is next to us. We are to lean across and get direction, hear what God wants us to do, to get the mind of Christ. We have the choice. So God gives us free will. That we're driving, we're at the steering wheel. We have the choice to listen to the lust of our flesh or to listen to the Spirit of the Lord. You have the choice, free will. And remember that we live in an environment where there's a fallen devil, a fallen angel, the devil, and then there's the fallen man, you and I, and then there's the fallen world. So in this situation of fallen devils, fallen man, and fallen world, stuff happens, doesn't it? Things happen. Trucks drive down the hill, leaking oil, knowing that they're leaking oil, but because they are fallen human beings, they leave the oil on the road. I come behind driving. I know that they've left oil behind there. I know it's raining, but because I'm a fallen man, instead of being cautious, I drive at 60 kilometers an hour in the rain. That's not God's fault. That's my fault. And as I listen to my flesh, allowing the, 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 the lies of the devil to, to tempt me, he tempts me into sin through my desires. But family, we are the ones who are at the steering wheel. God doesn't do the driving for us. He gives us free will. It's like a landlord. Um, you go to a landlord and you lease a house. You sign the lease agreement. You take the keys. And now you are in the house which you lease. This temple, this body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. God has paid the price for you and I, but He gives you and I the choice of how to live. The landlord is not free, by the way, to walk into his house and check the house anytime. He's given you the keys. He has to phone you and ask, can I have an appointment? Can I come and check at the house? He can't just walk in because through the lease agreement, he's given you the keys and he gives you free will. God has done the same for us. So let's remind ourselves, God is true love. If true love exists and God is true love, then true love must give choice. True love doesn't make robots and force people. True love gives choice. If true love gives choice, then choice opens the door to permission for good and or evil. I can choose to drive more carefully and more cautiously or not. Listen to the scripture. Jesus says that the father gave his son that none should perish, but that everyone should have everlasting life. His heart is that Everyone should have everlasting life, that none should perish. But he gives us the choice. Either we're going to respond to him is calling or not. You have the choice. Listen to James 4 verse 7. Scripture says, submit yourselves to the Lord. Resist the devil and he will flee. That shows you that sometimes the things that come our way is actually the devil. And God says the way out of falling is, is turning to the Lord and resisting the devil. There are things that come from the devil. So we realize we have flesh and we have a devil, a very real devil and a fallen world. So sitting there at your steering wheel and going through life saying, Whatever will be, will be. Whatever happens will happen, and no problem. I'll see what happens. Whatever pans out, 
whatever will be, will be, is actually not biblical. God actually wants you to resist the lies and believe Him. God actually wants you to fulfill His purpose. Listen to Acts 10.38 for a moment. The scripture says that Jesus came and He healed all those who were oppressed of the devil. In other words, it wasn't God who oppressed them. It was the devil who oppressed them. And if you're sitting at the steering wheel thinking, oh, God is oppressing me. It's God who's oppressing me. It's God who's causing these problems. Then actually what happens is we think that the source of our problem is God. Instead of recognizing the source of our problem is our flesh, the world, or the devil, and God is the solution. Many times the situations we're in is actually an attack of the devil and it's not the oppression of God at all. Or we've made wrong choices. You know, the scripture says, pride opens the door to destruction. And sometimes when we make, we operate in pride, we open the door for attack. Or we live in a fallen world. And so the fallen men and the fallen world impacts us. Regardless, we've all made wrong choices. Let me say again, the Lord is the answer to our problem, not the source of our problem. He's the source of our solution, not the source of our problem. So if God didn't do this, and yet He's sovereign, why did He allow this? God is sovereign in the sense that He is paramount and He's supreme. There's no one higher in authority than Father God. But that doesn't mean He exercises His power by controlling your will or my will. Because God has given us the freedom to choose free will. God doesn't make our choices for us. He recommends, He tells you what the Word is, He instructs, but we have to listen. Let's remember again, God is true love. True love gives choice. Therefore, choice opens the door to an opportunity for good and for evil. The question is, Joseph, or whatever situation you're going through, will you this morning pause to hear from God what His purpose is for you in the difficult time that you're going through. Joseph did. By the way, Jesus did too. And God calls you and I to pause and hear what God has called us to do. And I can tell you three things that God has definitely called you to do. God has definitely called you to pray for the jailer. God has definitely called you to pray for the people around you. God has definitely pray, called you to pray for your, your employer. God has definitely called you to pray for leaders. I can tell you that God has called you to serve too. Definitely called you to serve. And God has definitely called you to use the gifts that He's given you in the situation you're in. Let's listen again to Genesis verse 23. The keeper of the prison didn't look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord caused it, made it to prosper. So God's sovereignty means, this is what I believe, God's sovereignty means that nothing that is ever allowed to happen to your life cannot be turned for your good. Sovereignty means even when things happen to you, God can cause those things which happen to you to turn for your good. Tell your neighbor, for your good. It's not saying that what happened to you is good. It's saying that he's so sovereign, he can turn it to make it for your good. Satan attacks, your flesh opens a door, but God can turn it. Listen to Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. Let, let's underline his purposes because we're here to find his purposes. Hey, if you believe God's sovereign, as I do, 
you have got to be an optimist. If you believe God's sovereign, you will be an optimist because whatever happens to you can be turned for God's good. So let's look for God's purpose. Joseph, what can I do, Lord? What do you want me to do for you? That's why Jesus said, I haven't come to be served, but I've come to serve. So let's recognize the second thing. God is purposeful. God is sovereign and God is purposeful. Father God, because He's sovereign, He fashioned you with a purpose in mind because He is purposeful. He's a purposeful God. And He is so intent on even being purposeful to take everything that's bad and turn it for His purpose to good. Therefore, Joseph lets God work on his character in prison. He's been shamed. He's been humiliated. He's been falsely accused. He's in prison. And even in that place, even though all these bad things have happened, he lets God work on his character. He lets God humble him. He lets God encourage him to use his discernment, to use his leadership gift to use his prophetic gift, to use the gift of godly understanding, to use the gift of wisdom. In prison, Joseph becomes better, not bitter. How are you doing today? Are you getting better or are you getting more bitter? And you, you, you can do it by just listening to your, the way you speak. Your jokes, your sharing, the time of discussing at the table, because out of the heart flow the issues of life. You, you'll pick up where you're suddenly your sense of humor is cynical or negative or you don't have hope. If you believe God is sovereign and purposeful, you should be an optimist. When Joseph is sitting there and he's called by Potiphar to come and interpret the vision that he's received, Joseph doesn't just share the vision he has seen. He literally interprets it and lays out a strategy for dealing with the vision. This morning, God is asking you to receive his vision. God is also asking you to receive his strategy. That you apply his strategy Pharaoh is so blown away by what Joseph presents that he recognizes that this is God. And I want to remind you, Pharaoh is a pagan, a Baal-worshipping, corrupt leader. And yet Joseph is called by God to interpret the vision and help him and serve this corrupt leader, this sinner. Yet this sinner, this corrupt leader, looking at Joseph, says this in Genesis 41, verse 38. And Pharaoh said to one of his servants, can we find such a one as this, in a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Wow. Pharaoh attributes the gifts and the wisdom that Joseph has to God. I believe that's because Joseph's had the pride struggle. Joseph's had the purity struggle. Joseph's had the purpose struggle. And now he's just there to serve God. It's all for God. He's humbled himself. Lord, it's your will. Your will be done, not my will. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all of this, this strategy, this vision, there's no one as discerning or as wise as you. Wow. God was moving in Pharaoh now because of Joseph. He's hardly the perfect person to serve. Yet Joseph positions himself not to be served, but to serve just like Jesus. 
when Joseph is promoted out of prison, he starts serving as prime minister, the whole nation of Egypt. And whilst he's there, he's there for about nine years serving as prime minister before his brothers come for the first time. They've had seven good years of tremendous harvest and they've been saving the harvest. And now they come to two bad years. So it's nine years that he's been in charge and his brothers visit him now on the ninth year for the very first time. Remember the ones who betrayed him. And listen to the humility, listen to the understanding of sovereignty, listen to his understanding that God is purposeful. He says there in Genesis 45 verse five, but now my brothers, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me into slavery. You meant it for bad. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Listen to the purpose, to preserve life. You meant it for bad. God flipped it to good, sovereignty into purpose. God is sovereign, God is purposeful. To preserve life. It's almost like he's talking about, as Joel Martins talked about, there's this table that God prepares for us in the presence of his enemies, where we are supposed to serve one another the bread of life. Jesus was the bread of life and he calls us to serve. You prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. Joseph continues and he says, for these two years, the famine has been in the land and there's still five years left in which there'll neither be harvesting nor plowing. But God sent me, tell your neighbor, sent me. Powerful words. God sent me before you to preserve a prosperity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Again, God is sovereign, God is purposeful. So it's not you who sent me here, but God who sent me and he's made me, this, this part I really love, God has made me a father to Pharaoh a father to Pharaoh. In other words, Joseph was so humble that as he served with complete humility, no agenda, no personal agenda, no selfish agenda, just for God, he serves. And as he serves, because he's got no agenda, because he's completely humble, Pharaoh doesn't make him just a servant. Pharaoh makes him a father to Pharaoh. The truth of it is most of us have been raised believing that whatever makes me happy, whatever gives me promotion, whatever gives me more increase, whatever, whatever makes me comfortable, that's good for me. That's from God. Whatever makes me uncomfortable, whatever causes me to suffer, whatever is inconvenient for me, uh, that's from the devil, it's not from God. Just listen to what Paul says. He says, Jesus learned obedience through suffering. We think that discomfort, delay, risk, and suffering, inconvenience, and obstacles to the vision God has for us is not God's will, and it must be cast out in Jesus' name. Without knowing it, oftentimes, we worship money and our personal comfort. We worship pleasure and things quicker than we do the worship of God. God has called us not to a happy life, but he's called us to a holy life, a life of holiness. In fact, he says in 1 John 2 verse 15, he says, 
Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not even in him. For all that is of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. The world is passing away and the lust of it. But whoever does the will, the will of the Father abides forever. So I believe that true happiness is the blessed life where we find God's purpose and we fulfill God's purpose. We allow Him to speak into our spirit and we bring our flesh and our thoughts captive to His spirit where we seek God's will first, His righteousness, then all these things are added unto us. When Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's, He's trying to work out Lord, is there another way except to go through the cross? And finally, he says, nevertheless, Father, not my will be done, but your will done. Even Jesus went through the purpose struggle. It was his flesh against the Spirit of God. But Jesus then turns around to you and me. Tell your neighbor, this is for you. He says, pick up your cross and follow me. The purpose struggle. If God is sovereign, if God is purposeful, then let's recognize God made you with purpose. God made you with purpose. There was a purpose he made you for. He fashioned us, he made us unique. We're all different. He set us apart with a plan and a purpose, not to hurt and harm. In Ephesians 2.10, he says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, Listen, for good works, can you tell your neighbor, you have purpose, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, that we should fulfill them. In other words, God created you purposely for a purpose. In Psalm, he says, 139 verse 13, he says, you, are for, you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, Lord, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, your purposes, and that my soul knows very well. Marvelous are your works, your purposes. Marvelous is your intention, and that my soul knows very well. In Romans chapter 12, he says in verse 4, he says this amazing thing. He says, for as there are many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. In other words, we are created uniquely with different functions. He gave us purpose. And in the same chapter, Paul comes along and he says that each of us are given some of the motivational gifts, motivational gifts, and he he lists them. And every one of you have got some motivational gifts. And this morning, just listen to the seven motivational gifts because I believe what Paul, what Joseph did when he was in prison, I believe he stepped back and he started using the motivational gifts. The first motivational gift is prophecy, which is the gift of motivation. The second one is this, ministry, which is to serve. The third one is a teacher, somebody who studies and gets the root understanding and teaches. The next one is encouragement, an encourager. The next one is a giver an administrator, a leader, and the gift of mercy. You have one or more of these gifts in you. What Joseph did when he was in prison, what we need to do when we're in in prison of debt or prison of broken relationships is to use the gifts God's given us right now, right where we're at, in the situation you're in. Because remember, God is sovereign. Say with me, God is sovereign. Say with me, God is purposeful. If God is sovereign, God is purposeful, and He's made you with purpose, He's given you gifts, start using them right now. Don't say, this is a jailer, I can't serve him. No ways, not him, he doesn't qualify. By the way, Jesus gave up His throne in heaven when you and I were in sin. When I was drinking and I was following the world, when I was playing rugby and drinking and following the world, Jesus died for me in my sin. 
And he raised me and separated me. In the same way I wanted to say to you this morning, I believe God says, don't look for someone who's qualified enough for you to serve because Jesus looked for you and he loved you when you were in sin. It's so easy to write people off, isn't it? And just say, oh, he doesn't qualify. What does God say? He gave up his throne for you. Serve God right where you are. Especially if things are going wrong. Especially if you're being falsely accused and defamed. Especially if you're being put in a trap. You might think those accusations and those lies are setbacks. Can I tell you a secret from the heart of the Father? Man's setbacks are God's way of setups. Man's setbacks are God way, God's way of setups. Joseph had many setbacks, but they were all a setup to build his character, to promote him. One of the greatest presidents of the United States of America that I, from my perspective, in my research, was Abraham Lincoln. He's an amazing man who, when he got into power and authority, he wrote the Declaration of the Emancipation of Slavery. He set the people free. He dealt with that demonic thing. But you know, if you ever heard of setbacks, how many of you have heard about Abraham Lincoln's setbacks? If you could just put up his, your hand, just a few. Let me just share some. The first one is he lost his job in 1832. He was defeated for state legislature later the same year. He failed in business in 1833. He was elected to state legislature in 1834. His bride, his sweetheart, died in 1835. He had a nervous breakdown in 1836. He was defeated for speaker in 1838. Talk about a bad few years. Can you say with me some setbacks? He was defeated for nomination in, to Congress in 1843. He was elected to Congress in 1846. He lost renomination in 1848. He was rejected from being land officer in 1849. He was defeated from US Senate in 1854. He was defeated for nomination of vice president in 1856. He was defeated in the US Senate in 1858. But in 1880, 1860, he was elected to the president of the United States of America. Setbacks didn't hold him back. Setbacks didn't hold Joseph back. Setbacks didn't hold Jesus back. And I want to say to you, don't let setbacks hold you back because God wants to use a setback for a setup. He gave you the steering wheel. You have the choice now. Will you listen to your flesh or will you listen to the spirit? God is sovereign, God is purposeful, and God made you with purpose. So we're all going to go through the pride struggle, we're going to go through the purity struggle, and we're going to go through the purpose struggle. Will you let Him humble you? Will you let Him work on you? Because I believe God would work on us. If I could ask you, just look at Genesis 50, verse 20. Joseph ends, listen to the humility as he says this. He says, but as for you, as he speaks to his brothers, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring it about this day, to save many lives. Now, therefore, don't be afraid. I'll provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Family, I would invite you to the table this morning in the presence of thine enemies to take the bread of life from God, that he is sovereign, that he is purposeful, and that he's created you with purpose. Joseph was so purpose oriented that in Genesis 50, 25, he says, God will visit you and you will carry my bones from here. He knew that even his bones were carried, going to be carried out. I pray that you would be purposeful. Can I ask you to stand this morning as we come before the Lord and just recognize He's sovereign, He's purposeful, and He's made you with a purpose.
Can you just close your eyes for a moment and bow your heads? If you recognize that you've been in a place where your flesh has been leading you, <coughs> you recognize that you've been offended with the jailer, you've been offended with Potiphar, you've been offended with the Pharaoh in your life. And you're in the place of recognizing that you, you've got to a place of this, just seeing setbacks, 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 and you're discouraged. And this morning you recognize that God is saying, hang on, I want to set you up today. I want to set you up that my purpose be fulfilled. If that's you, can I ask you just to put up your hand? If you need God's purpose to be revealed to you, can I ask you just to put up your hand? Father, you see the hands, and I pray, Father, that you would reveal your purpose, your plans, your purpose in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, I pray that you come and minister your power, your love into the lives of each one this morning. In Jesus' name, I pray for your grace that your purpose be revealed. In Jesus' name. Just as we, in that place, if there's any jailer, any Potiphar, any Pharaoh in your life, that you recognize has entrapped you, got you into a difficult place, and you're really struggling with that. Can I just point you to a scripture in Job 42 verse 10? Job had been going through a difficult time. And jo the scripture says this, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. Job had to learn first, step back into God's purpose. What is God's purpose? To pray for Pharaoh, to pray for his friends, to pray for the jailer, to pray for Potiphar, and to serve just as Jesus served. To receive Jesus' love, but to give God's love too. Love them just as I have loved you. Father, we come before you this morning and we, we ask you for forgiveness for the anger, the disappointment, and the fear that we've allowed through the setbacks. This morning we take the steering wheel of life again, having received the keys of authority, and we ask you to guide us now our guide, our instructor, Holy Spirit, our teacher, that we would live life as you've called us to, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship him this morning. Amen.